Hello everybody, how's it going? Ben Gothard here with another Project Egg interview, and today we're talking to Nick Kuzmich from Toronto. How are you doing today, Nick? Very good. I'm uh, excited to be here, man. Absolutely. Excited to have you here. So let's jump right in. Uh, my first sure. question for you, Nick, is what is your story? Oh, geez. Well, which part of what story? <laughs> I mean, how we are doing what we're doing now? Yeah, all of it. God, okay. Well, you know what? I'll take you all the way back. Um, I was told from my mother that I wasn't supposed to be born. Uh, my mother and father were trying to have kids for many, many, many years, didn't have any luck with it. Uh, so they were trying to f figure out the adoption route, in fact. Uh, what they had realized, though, even through that, and this is years ago now, years through, they had actually looked into doing adoption through the Catholic Church, but uh, they weren't Catholic. So the Catholic Church said, forget you, that's not going to work. Um, so through a crazy tale of events, um, meeting people, uh, my mother got involved with the church, um, had some of the ministers get involved with, you know, praying for her and all that. Uh, wherever you stand with that, how the story goes or how it was communicated to me was that the month after that, she conceived me. Um, I'm an only child. Uh, they couldn't have any kids any before or after me, but then I was kind of born. So there's almost a sense that there was a little bit of a a greater purpose for me to accomplish uh, right from early on in, in, in my life. Uh, fast forward. It was almost like that started to come to fruition because just about everything that I did turned to gold. What I mean by that is like I remember being in the seventh grade and being my student body president for a school that went to, to the ninth grade. Um, I remember getting involved with certain things and just getting amazing results. I remember starting my own first business and um, you know making more money than most of the people who are my teachers at school. I mean, it was just an incredible experience of, you know, as the, some say, the Midas touch. And then I guess it was the universe who was just like, this dude is taking too much credit. Um, he's a little bit too arrogant and too prideful. He thinks he knows how to do everything. I think it's time to teach this kid a lesson. Um, and almost overnight, literally, I think I had, you know, what I would call a seven year bout with Murphy's Law, essentially where everything that I touch collapsed and failed and broke apart and got destroyed. Everything from my business endeavors to my investments to my uh, relationship with my wife uh, to everything literally that I was doing began to fell apart. Uh, so it was a crazy experience and that lasted for seven years. And I think it was even worse because when you come from a high, high and you go to a low, low, it feels worse than if you didn't have the high, high to begin with. And I went through all this thoughts in my mind about like, what the hell am I doing? Why is this happening? I don't trust myself anymore. I have zero confidence in the world and life uh, to the point where I remember, I don't remember the date exactly, but it was a late December evening. I'm sitting at my desk looking up the clock and it was 1.17 in the morning. Um, and I found myself in the Googles on my, uh, on my laptop typing in the easiest way to take my life. Um, I need an easy way out. Uh, I was too much of a coward to look for the hardest way, so I looked for the easiest way. Um, and I remember thinking about going through that decision. Well, long story short, obviously that that didn't happen, thank God. Um, and it's been since then an upward trek towards understanding, you know, what's meaningful in life to me, uh, why am I around, what's important versus what's not, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say now, many years later, I've met the, the woman of my dreams. We have a, a little seven month old at the time we're recording this, uh, have an awesome, awesome family, have an awesome life, have a great business and uh, getting much closer to living the life I think I was meant to live than, you know, just not too long ago where I was kind of at my wits end and, and completely hopeless about what was next. So yeah, that's the story in a nutshell. Wow. That's powerful, man. That really is powerful. And, and I want to thank you for being so transparent with it uh, because I really feel like the more genuine that we can be and, and, and the more that we can share, uh, the more that we can positively impact people. So I do want to thank you for that. But I want to, I want to touch on your history a little bit. So, sure. you know, you said you were an only child um, and, and you kind of had this, this or you at least felt like you had this greater purpose growing up. Uh, yeah. Can can you maybe talk a little bit more specifically about what you did in your childhood, the the different endeavors that that you did um, embark on, and, and and maybe give us some insight on that time. 
Yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, I was just like any other kid. I just felt like, and maybe this is just what everybody feels like. Maybe it was not special to me. Maybe it wasn't this special anything that was really going on. But, you know, from a young age, I just felt like uh, maybe there's more to life than what, you know, the the sports that I play, the baseballs in the summers and the hockey's in the winters. I'm Canadian. I got to play hockey. Um, You know, all, all these types of things. Maybe they're just more to that. I had this deeper sense that maybe there was some greater meaning and maybe I'm supposed to contribute to the world in certain ways. But I just didn't know what it meant as a young kid growing up. Um, it just started when I was kind of in early high school or, or late junior high going into high school that I figured my narrative told me that my way to bring contribution to the planet was through my faith at the time. So when I was 17 years old, uh, I actually got hired as a pastor, uh, started pastoring. When I was 19, I became ordained. Um, and then started my own church and actually had my own church for 14 years of my life. So the manifestation of me feeling like I needed to make a difference in the world started happening through my faith narrative and feeling that that was the way. Now, as that evolved over time, again, I did that for about 14 years. I realized that that's not the only way I can make a difference. And maybe there's even better ways that I can make a difference than just through that. So that took me through a journey of rediscovery and figuring out what are some of those other ways that I could be able to do some of those things. Uh, but that was it. I mean, my, my childhood was just like any other childhood, except for, and again, I don't know if this is true just for me or everybody else, but in the back of my mind, there's this thought where, like, I just want to do something a little bit different. I didn't know what it was, but it wasn't until I was in junior high or high school before I started to, to act on that sort of thing. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned earlier on in the interview that uh, when you started your first business, that you were making more money than some of your teachers. Uh, yeah. So when was that uh, chronologically, and, and maybe you could give a little bit of insight on what that business was. Yeah, so the, the very first uh, half business, half job, um, and, and maybe you're aware of this, Ben, I, the, the first thing I ever did was I started with Cutco Knives. Um, I became a vector marketing sales rep and very quickly did I rise up in the ranks so much so that when I was uh, 16, 17, I was given the opportunity to start my own branch office. Um, hence, that was kind of my own business. I mean, when you own your own branch office, you got to pay for all the expenses. You're not getting paid a salary from anybody. You're getting pay, uh, paid an override on your entire office. And so that's what I did. Um, and I was making, um, in my eyes back then, money hand over fist. Um, and as a young kid, I'm like, wow, this is this is quite incredible. And I'm, I have great responsibility and I'm managing people who are twice my age and we're doing really well. But the reality was they were very, very busy work weeks. Um, and it's not like I could say I was passionate about the job. I mean, our office was selling knives to people who probably didn't want the knives or spent, you know, didn't want to spend two thousand dollars on a set of knives. Um, so that was my first endeavor that opened me up into, because I was really good at that. I had some people recruit me to be a salesperson, a speak from stage salesperson for a high net worth, uh, investment company. So this is where they would hold seminars. I'd get up on stage when I was again, like 17, 18, 19, uh, I would present an offer and get people to spend 10, 15, 20, $30,000 on an investment package. Uh, and I got paid pretty handsomely for that too. And that opened me up to kind of traveling a little bit and getting experience and rubbing shoulders with some really smart people, again, who were double my age or even more. Um, and, and again, even just escalated the income and, and the revenue early on before I had my little bout with Murphy's Law there. Absolutely. So, so uh, let's talk about your time uh, with Cutco. Let's talk about um, your experiences there because – um, Good old days. Yeah, because uh, you know I feel like in order to really excel in a position like that, you have to be good at sales. You have to be good sure. at talking to people, right? So sure. can you not only give insight into your personal approach to sales and talking to people, but maybe a general, uh, some general insight on why those things are important as an entrepreneur? Yeah, uh, great question. So I think in general, we'll start there. Um, it, I think there's two things. Number one, I don't think anybody likes to be sold to, but a lot of people like to buy. And I think if we really understand why people buy anything, it makes the sales process that much easier. So a lot of people in their mind and their perspective feel like sales is turning a no into a yes. 
So, hey, do you want to buy my knives? And they're like, no. And then the sales process begins. How do I overcome objections? How do I provide value? How do I show the benefits? How do I offer a plan? How do I craft an offer so that someone turns around who was a no and turns it and, and I hopefully the battle of the sale is turning a no into a yes. Um, I never took that approach. To me, uh, sales was always a consultative. So it was rather than me trying to sell you something, it's like, hey, what do you really need and how can I provide that to you? Um, and sales connected with marketing, which is much more what I do now, is finding the people who are already yeses and then delivering the result to them. So for example, if I were, and I know this is a bit of a stereotype, but for the sake of the example, let's go with it. Uh, it you know, if I met a guy, you know, big burly dude, lumberjack, he chopped wood for a living, he's just massive and pulls weight every day and drinks a protein shake and, and you know, steak dinner, lunch and breakfast, like that's what he did. And then I came to him and I'm like, hey man, do you want to go to this like all sprouts vegan salad bar with me for lunch? Um, it would be a difficult endeavor. I mean, I'd have to convince them. I'd have to do. I'd uh, have to figure out some way to make that work, uh, and that wouldn't be an easy process. And he probably wouldn't enjoy it, and I wouldn't have enjoyed it either. Or the alternative is to go to that guy and say, "Hey, man, I know the best steakhouse in town. I'm buying. Do you want to go?" I mean, how quick would I get to a yes then? And so the difference there is really understanding and finding the people who already want the solution. They just might not know about your solution. And so your job is to explain it in a way that can help them. I think that's what true sales is. Now, I learned that the hard way through Cutco because essentially I was selling people knives, um, probably stuff they didn't quite want and certainly something that they didn't want to spend $2,000 on. Fortunately, I think because I took the approach of the consultative sales, uh, because I cared more about that person and the benefit that they would get much more than me making the sale, I think I was able to sell a lot more. So my approach right now is if anyone in a conversation with me ever feels like they're being sold to, uh, then I'm doing it wrong. If anyone who's in a, in a conversation with me feels like, wow, I really want that solution because it solves a problem that I have, then I'm doing it right. And I think that's super important for entrepreneurs to understand on two levels. Number one, when you do marketing, your goal shouldn't be to turn no's into yeses. Your goal is to find the yeses and then present your solution properly. And two, realizing that just about everything we do in one way, shape, or form is in fact sales. Um, not the icky form of sales, but the true form of, hey, I have a solution I think you should consider. And if you can go into it with my, that mindset, not thinking that sales is a bad thing, um, but it's a consultative thing, and you're just helping people find solutions that they're already looking for, it makes the process 100% easier. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, for those that are listening, uh, Nick actually just gave you some really good actionable tips. Uh, so, so I highly encourage you to try to implement those into your own business uh, and, and, and see the difference that it can make, right? Because those were really good tips. So cool. um, let's talk about the next position that you, that you went to um, as the on-stage salesperson. Uh, yeah. so, so can you talk a little bit about, uh, because it sounds like that was more of a public speaking role uh, in addition to you know, a sales role. Uh, sure. Can you talk about the difference between one-on-one -on -one selling and uh, I guess I guess group selling where, where you had to speak to a large audience and maybe talk about the differences there and, and how somebody can better their own public speaking skills. Sure. Uh, so in a one-on-one -on -one environment, obviously, it's very consultative. So you're deeply analyzing the need of that individual person who's sitting across from you and seeing if you can, in fact, provide a solution. Uh, in a group selling format, you need to generalize a lot more. Um, because if you get too specific with one person, you might lose the other person. I think it was Chet Holmes who once said, if you got to go center stage at Super Bowl halftime and had hundreds of millions of eyes on you and you had seven seconds to say something that would get people interested in what you have to say, what would you say? And I think the process of mentally going through an exercise like that is, if I have a solution, how do I present it in such a way that makes sense for people at mass rather than just the individual person in front of me? And I think that's one of the things that you need to realize when you're going uh, or you're sharing in front of a group rather than an individual. It's how do I generalize this to the point where it's applicable to everybody in the room? 
but simultaneously, how do I present it in such a way that every person in the room feels like I'm talking to them? Um, and I think the way to do that is understanding, as bad as it sounds or as good as it sounds, I think at the end of the day, humans are humans, and we all essentially have some core needs and fundamental things that we need to overcome. And if we can tap into some of those core needs and provide true solutions for them, uh, everyone will almost feel like you're talking to me. So in a group setting, I would obviously highly suggest that you think about what those things are. What are the general human needs and desires that drive people to take actions and then based on those, present and lead with those? Um, and then the other thing, just about how to become a pub better public speaker. I think it's a combination of very tactical, do it over and over and over again. Um, watch people that you enjoy and like and pick up and learn traits from them that way. Um, get honest feedback from the people around you who are like, dude, you should have never said that. That kind of stuck weird. Uh, or that was great. Say that again. Um, and I think the big thing now, like back in the day, public speaking, you were a good public speaker. If you could say the right words at the right time and give a great presentation and be really swag about it. And everyone was like, wow, he was a great speaker. I think today's day and age that's changed. I think the more authentic you can be, and the more you just get up there and be yourself um, and and not authentic as a sales tactic, authentic as like, this is just me and I really want to help you. If you go in with the intention to help and you're as true to yourself as possible, I think that would make great public speakers. Again, there are certain little things that you could work on in terms of delivery and performance and all that. Um, but I think that comes secondary to your intent and your your intent or desire to help, and secondly, just being authentic to to the true version of who you are. Absolutely, absolutely. So you know, specifically in your own life, uh, with with you know doing that on stage sales, uh, you know, gig for a little bit. Um, what sort of things did you learn, and, and and what sort of things did you really take away from those experiences? going onto the stage and, and actually putting yourself into that situation? Uh, for me personally, it was just like I, what I discovered about myself is that this is something I really enjoy doing. Um, not everybody enjoy and And I think that's important to say because I think there's different ways to run your business. There's different ways to generate leads. There's different ways to acquire new customers and clients. Uh, and what most people throw out there is saying, hey, writing a book is the best way to do it. Another person will say, hey, doing a webinar is the best way to do it. And then someone else will say live events are the best way. And another guy will say speaking is the best way. And to be honest with you, I don't, I don't think any of those are true, but I think all of them are true. And what I mean by that is if you find what you enjoy and you find what you're good at and you find what kind of lights you up inside, that is the thing that you need to be doing um, to help grow your business and even to fulfill your purpose as an entrepreneur. Uh, I found that I had the greatest stresses in my life when I started chasing things that people told me were the right way to go, but they just didn't feel good to me. So I did learn that specifically to kind of sales and marketing and speaking. Um, you know, again, I, I what I found is that every human being essentially has needs. Um, nobody likes to be sold to, but people do like to buy. And if you can, in fact, be truly authentic about your desire to help someone and you could provide a solution that can help them achieve a desired outcome, then you are in a very, very good place. And your entire entrepreneurial or business journey should revolve around that very concept of providing solutions to problems. Absolutely, absolutely. So you mentioned that when you did go and start doing those uh, speeches and, and you know speaking on stage, that you had a little bit of extra income and that allows you to go travel. Um, was that before you um, you know before you became ordained, or, or uh, what was kind of the timeline of that? And, and uh, maybe you could give a little bit of insight on where you went and, and how that really impacted you as an individual. Yeah, well, so it was happening simultaneously because one of the things I just I realized is that as a pastor, I'm not going to make a huge ton of money through that process. Plus, mentally, I didn't want to be in a place where my congregation felt like, um, hey, I'm paying for this guy's lifestyle. So there was always the side hustle, uh, if you will. It was the business that was going to pay for my lifestyle, and this was going to kind of feed my soul at the time. 
So that was going on simultaneously the whole time. Um, and then I think it's weird when you go amongst everybody uh, who is aspiring to be an entrepreneur or aspiring to achieve financial freedom. Uh, one of the first things you ask anybody is, hey, once you've achieved financial freedom, what's the first thing you're going to do? Um, the answer that everybody gives, and I don't know why, is travel. Uh, everyone wants to kind of travel. So I'm like, you know what? Same with me. I want to travel. And so, you know, I had the good fortune of um, going to Southeast Asia multiple times, visiting all the places out there that I want to uh, visit. Uh, I mean, almost in every state in the States. Uh, I live in Canada. I mean, just go, went out there, uh, Europe, the whole ga- the whole gambit of it. And uh, I think a couple of learnings from that is, is one, it gave me a greater appreciation for what we have here. Um, traveling to certain places in the world, you realize that your worst day is still considered the best day for somebody else. Um, it gives you perspective on how good we have it and lets you have a little greater sense of, of gratitude. I think that's an important thing. Um, secondly, to realize that there's more to the world than your little bubble. Uh, Everyone lives in their own little bubble, and they think this is the world, and this is how the world should be. Uh, And frankly, there are some people in the world who are doing it better than we are. And if we can learn from some of those things, I think that's a good thing. And then thirdly, uh, what I came to learn really quickly is travel is overrated. I ended up spending a lot of time on planes. In fact, I'm still spending a lot of time on planes right now for my work. Uh, And what used to be this great desire to travel as much as I could has now turned into I really hope I don't have to travel. Uh, I wish I could just stay home with my family and and take care of things that way. So those are probably my three greatest learnings about this travel and the desire to travel. Um, True gratitude for what I have. Uh, that we don't always have it right and we should learn from other people who may be doing things better. And thirdly, travel, again, at the end of the day, is not all that it's meant to be and the grass is not always greener on the other side. Um, Enjoy what you got and make the most of it. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. So, you know, in all your travels, I'm sure you had a few, um, you know, hopefully more than a few really cool experiences. What would you say traveling around was probably the coolest experience that that you got to uh, you got to have. Yeah, so if I mean if there's one takeaway from anyone listening to this podcast, it is that you need to at some point in your life book a trip to go to Bora Bora. Uh, uh, my wife and I on our one year anniversary ended up spending ten or eleven days in Bora Bora. It's the most fascinating place on the planet. Uh, we ended up getting dive certified out there um, because it's the best place in the world to do that. Um, and it's just fantastic. I mean, you're living on overwater bungalows way out there. Uh, it was whale migrating season, so you could see whales swimming right by. You could jump off your bungalow into the lagoon and swim with sharks and stingrays. And stingrays out there are kind of like puppies. They come and they like snuggle up on you and you can pet them and feed them. Um, a part of that journey too was, uh, Bora Bora is the only place in the world where you could snorkel with whales. So uh, my wife and I took a boat out to deep blue sea where whales were migrating. We had our skipper with us and um, they know how to do it. I, you, at a certain time when the whale's breaching and goes under and takes a nap, you can jump into the water and actually snorkel very close to these really large uh, whales. So from, from a travel experience, if you're kind of the adventure type and you want a unique experience that you, it's very difficult to experience anywhere else, Um, May there be one takeaway from our conversation at some point figure out it's not cheap but at some point figure out how you can get to Bora Bora and spend at least a week there Uh, you'll have memories that are going to last forever. That's awesome that's that's so cool. Um, So you know I want to I want to take it uh, back a little bit to um, when you decided to uh, you know become ordained and, and go down that route. Um, sure. What really inspired you to do that uh, and, and maybe give us a little bit of insight on that time period, kind of what was going on in your, in your mind uh, throughout that time? Yeah, yeah. in short, it was, it was simple. It was I felt like I needed to do something positive in the world. And my worldview and my narrative at the time told me that the best way to do that was through my faith. And so I said, what better way to do that than to start your own church? But how can you start your own church if you're not ordained? And so I took the path of, of going through that process, getting ordained, starting my own church when I was quite young, uh, which in hindsight is very much of an entrepreneurial endeavor. I mean, to start your own church, to have to pay your bills, to be able to take care of things, um, to have people that you're accountable to, that whole sort of thing. Uh, ended up teaching me a whole ton. It, it t- taught me a lot about how to work with people. It taught me a lot about expectations. It taught me a lot about the institution, quote unquote, and the good, bad, and the ugly around that. 
Uh, it taught me about what it means to like take care of your bills. It taught me what it meant to be judged um, and to be in a limelight and to have people have opinions about you that aren't entirely true. Uh, so there's a whole gambit of it. And part of me, I say, it was like the best of my years and my worst of my years. Great experiences, totally amazing learning experiences that I wouldn't trade for the world, but truly some of the hardest time of my life as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think the the whole thing of that was the opportunities that presented themselves to me and the narrative that was going on in my head told me that that was the way I should do it. And so I did. And then throughout the years, that changed, of course. But that's kind of essentially what took us there or took me there and kept me there for 14 years of my life. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. So, you know, it, it um, was probably a low point in your life. Um, but, but if you feel comfortable talking about it, yeah. um, you know, I'd like to explore a little bit uh, that, that time in December at, at 1.17 a.m. Um, mm -hmm. how, how did you get through it? Because, you know, I feel like a lot of people on their journey, um, they, they may either think about that or, or, or kind of these, these flashes of horror go through their mind at some point. Yeah. Uh, they may think that they have nowhere else to go. Um, yeah. can, can you maybe give some insight and, and maybe a little bit of guidance on how you got through it and, and if anybody else is in a, a position like that or, or just mm. kind of feels trapped, um, maybe give some practical advice on, on how they can get out of it, how they can break out of that. Yeah, so I think there's two things that are, are key to remember. One, it's our natural inclination that when we are in a tough time to get out of it as soon as we possibly can. It's kind of a fight or flight response or like a, hey, a pain survival response. Um, I think one of the things that we have to remember, and I don't, again, I don't remember where I read this. I think it was a book or a movie that I saw, but a line that stuck out to me very, very vividly during that time um, was that pain was meant to be felt. And the idea that pain wasn't meant to be avoided Pain was meant to be felt. And I remember going through this experience thinking initially, I just got to get out of this, man. How can I kind of overcome this? But as soon as I came to terms with the fact that there may be a lesson to be learned here, that this is not something that I need to rush out of, but something that I need to experience in the fullness of its agony, um, that was a very powerful lesson for me. So rather than being in a rush to get out, I said, okay, well, this is it. This is a reality of life. This is something that I need to experience in its fullest extent, no matter how much it hurts. And I'm not going to be in a rush to get out because A, there's lessons to learn. Um, and B, this is just part of the human experience. If you want to experience the highest of highs, that comes at the price of also experiencing the lowest of lows. You can't be selective of your human experience. So this is the human experience and you need to experience all of it in its beauty and all of it in its agony. So that was one thing. It just I'm, I decided at some point I'm not in a rush to get out of this. I'm going to do my best to just experience the fullness of this and see what is in store for me through this. That was one thing. Um, and then from a very practical standpoint, for anybody who's going through this, I think the only thing really that got me through was I had a handful of people, literally people that I can count on one hand, who came to me and said, Nick, we're here. We're for, we're, we're for you. We're in your corner. Uh, we're not here to give you advice. We're not here to pat you on the back and be a motivational person so that you could do it. We're here to be with you through this. And if you need anything, you call on us. If you need a shoulder to cry on, you have a shoulder to cry on. Whatever you need, we are here. Um, and it was a time where I experienced what I can only define as grace. This idea of an undeserving love, an unconditional love from people who meant a lot to me. Who said, hey, man, we don't judge you. We, we know that stuff is going on. We're not here to give you advice or pat you on the back or motivate you. We're just here to let you know that we're here. And no matter what, we're here. Um, that was kind of the healing process. And it took time. And it wasn't easy um, because, again, I was trying to be slow and intentional about it. But, uh, yeah, that was the only thing. It wasn't reading some fancy book or attending some seminar or having some intervention and saying, hey, you could do it. And some guy slapped me in the face and said, wake up from it. Um, it was a handful of really good, loving people who de demonstrated grace in its purest form um, and let me just go through it the way I needed to go through it. Wow. Thank you for that. Thank, thank you for your, uh, your transparency with that. Uh, I think that's yeah. really powerful. Um, so, you know, having having 
come through that experience and, and um, you know, won that battle, if you will, um, what are some of the things that you truly learned on the inside? What are the, what are the biggest takeaways that you got from that that now contribute to your success later in life? Uh, that's a great question. A uh, part of it, I think, is, uh, I mean, I came out of that with a, a whole new level of gratitude. Um, yeah, the old saying goes, you don't really know what you've lost until you've lost it. Uh, yeah, there's probably some truth to that. But now, because of going through stuff like that, every little thing is, a, is an element of gratitude for me. And I know, I mean, I fly a lot. I'm in planes a lot. I just know looking out the window, I'm like, oh, my God, like this is uh, we're flying above the clouds and I'm traveling at the speed of whatever I am to get to where I need to go. Um, little things of, you know, when my daughter smiles at me, I'm like, wow, like this could not maybe not have happened if I made some bad decisions in the past. Um, so one of the greatest takeaways was just a, a true sense of gratitude and a realization that everything I have now could be gone tomorrow. So don't take it for granted. Um, so that was definitely one thing. Uh, number two, I, I realized the importance of good people around you. And I know that's overrated. A lot of people say, well, you know, you're the sum total of the five people you hang around with the most. I don't think that's true. Um, but I do think that having some really good people around you to get you through these types of situations, circumstances is super important. I realized the true resilience of a human being, um, that humans can get through anything should they choose to. Um, it's very easy to give up, uh, very difficult to say I'm going to keep going. But once you do keep going, um, that the, the human has the ability to be pretty darn resilient about stuff. Um, and then lastly, I think happiness, and I put that in quotes because I think we all desire to be happy and I love being happy and, and all that. But I also think that that's being sold to us in a way that's not right. Um, because what it essentially says is that we all have to seek happiness uh, rather than be happy, which I think is different. Um, and then that happiness can only come as the result of achieving certain thing or getting a certain outcome when really you could be happy in the best of times and the worst of times. Um, and, you know, I love to be motivational. I love to encourage people. But, uh, you know, when people are going through hard times, people will say, oh, don't worry, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, sometimes there isn't. And you've got to be OK with that. Right. There's just something that you aren't over going to aren't going to overcome. There's certain things that are just going to hurt and they're going to hurt like hell and they're never going to stop hurting. Um, and and I think that's OK. So you know, those would be some of the lessons that kind of pulled through that experience and how that's led to, you know, where we are today in our business. I think one of the other things I just I didn't mention yet was early on in my business career, if you will, when things were going well, when I had the Midas touch. People are always a means to an end for me. So if I ever had an, an argument, uh, not an argument, uh, an engagement, or I'd spoke to somebody, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, are you going to help me get closer to my goal or not? Uh, if it is, I'll bring you into my life and we'll take advantage of the opportunity. Uh, if you're not, then get the hell out of my way or I'll steamroll you over. Uh, and then after this kind of whole experience, I realize that people are not a means to an end. People are the end. It is the end. It's the only reason we do anything. And so if you carry that mentality into business as well, uh, I think you'll have a much more successful business when rather than trying to chase profit, um, you chase the desire to help people and work with people. It leads to a better overall result, um, but even more so a better overall experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that's really powerful what you were saying that people are not a means to the end. People are the end. Right. And, and, you know, I, I definitely think that building relationships and, and, and having uh, people, meaningful people in your in your life are um, you know, that, that's the most important thing. So, right. um, you know, in in after those seven years um, of the tough ones, the, the tough ones. Right. Um, what was the turning point for you? At, at what point did you say or, or at least think? Okay, you know, I'm I'm out of this. Um, you know, my life's really turning around. And, and what? How did that manifest itself in your life? Yeah. Uh, so I don't I don't think there is 
uh, necessarily this one turning or tipping point. I think that's just kind of part of life in general. Um, there's always going to be ebbs and flows. There's always going to be good and bad. There's always going to be this constant struggle and figuring out and sorting out of the good and the bad. Um, so yeah, I don't think, I think it's a, it's a dangerous proposition to go into a situation, business or otherwise, thinking, okay, it's only going to go up from here or it's only going to be good from here or whatever it be. Uh, I think the reality is that it life is a journey. It's hard and it's easy. Uh, it's both at the same time. There's going to be good and there's going to be bad. Um, and that's been the journey. So although I probably never hit that kind of a low ever since then, uh, there's been good days and there's been bad days. Uh, there's been easy days and there's been extremely hard days. There's been days that I wanted to give up and days where I'm like, I can conquer the world. And I think the important part of that whole thing is just realizing in the, in the back of your mind um, that that's what it is. It's not this constant pursuit of the high with the avoidance of the low. It's this is what it is. And that's the beauty of life. That's the fun part about it is that it's not boring and stalemate. And sometimes we get these stresses and sometimes we got these things that just make life interesting. And the overcoming of it just makes us better people. And even if we don't overcome it, we could still be better people. Uh, so that would probably be my my kind of greatest understanding moving forward um, is that I haven't gotten there and I'll never overcome permanently. Um, it's just but now I'm kind of better equipped to deal with some of the ebbs and flows that happen as a result. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, you know, we talked a lot about your past. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about what you're doing now. Um, okay. Can you maybe give a little bit of insight on what your biggest focuses are as of right now? Yeah. So right now I run a, a boutique digital marketing agency that focuses primarily on Facebook. So we run Facebook ads for some really, really big names and some really great businesses. Um, and we've been doing that for about 18 months and that's really the core of what we do. And it's exciting because we actually are able to bridge these businesses that have great solutions for, for people and find their ideal prospects for them. So that's great. Uh, that's also led to speaking and training and consulting. Uh, so we have a whole arm of our business that focuses on the teaching, training, consulting, um, speaking side of things, which really excites me because that kind of brings me back to my old days when I was a pastor and when I was doing these sales from stage, it kind of like reinvigorates that light. Um, between those two things, really, my focus, mine and my wife's focus, is to uh, build a business that, and we're on our way and and getting there, but it's to build a business that doesn't require us to work, but allows us to work when we need to and when we want to. Um, and now with a seven-month-old daughter in my life, um, my priorities have changed and shifted. I mean, I really care about one main thing, and that's making sure that um, she gets the time, energy, and effort that she wants and needs and that she gets the life that we want to provide for her. Uh, so that's the focus now. It's it's That's my life now. I don't, I'm one of those people who don't think about tomorrow. I'm one of those people who don't necessarily have a goal or a game plan or a vision board. People say, hey, what's your life going to look like in three years? I have no bloody clue. I mean, I don't care because the last time I had a three-year plan, by the time I got there, it was completely different than what I planned anyways. Um, so we do our best to live in the moment and to live in now. And I'm here with you now, and that's all I'm thinking about. And when we get off this, I'm going to think about whatever I'm doing then and move on. So I think, uh, yeah, right now it's it's this business that we have. It's great. I don't want to build it into a gazillion dollar business. Um, we're happy where we are. We have a daughter that we're we're really trying to take care of and, and give her an amazing life. Um, and then doing our best just to live in in the moment as it presents itself to us. Awesome and and congratulations on your uh, on your daughter, my friend. That, that's uh, that's incredible. Uh, yeah. uh, thank that's you, my friend. Yes, yeah, tons of fun. So you know, maybe uh, give a little bit of insight on uh, where you um, like where you started your business, how, your your digital marketing business. Um, when did you start it, and how did you develop the skills that you did in order to become as successful as you have been? Yeah, so how I started, frankly, I don't even actually specifically remember. Um, there was always elements of it in everything that I was doing. I mean, digital marketing always kind of played a role in what I did. Um, but here was the truth. The skill set came from truly working in the trenches, uh, not from any book or conference or, or podcast or anything like that. I'm not saying those things are bad. But I think for the most part, if there's entrepreneurs listening to this, one of the greatest diseases amongst entrepreneurs is what I call infobesity. Um, 
way too much information consumption without any implementation or execution. So uh, for us, or for me specifically, it was just being in the trenches, putting my own dollars on the line, learning it the hard way, school of hard knocks, realizing what works and what doesn't. Uh, and all of the greatest lessons that I ended up learning were never taught to me in a book anyway. It's like no one's sharing that stuff. That's the only stuff that you can learn by doing it the hard way. Um, you know, I was scared spitless to learn how to dive. I'm not a fan of open water. It kind of freaks me out. Um, but it's not like, hey, I could read all the books in the world about how to have the respirator and what it's like if your goggles fall off underwater and what happens when you run out of oxygen. Um, but until you're in deep blue ocean surrounded by sharks um, and doing it over and over and you start lightly, of course, and you dive shallow water and then you dive deeper water and then you dive with more advanced people. Um, and frankly, I still get scared when I dive, but it's such an exhilarating experience that I can't look forward. I mean, I always look forward to the next time. But again, none of that stuff you could learn by reading or being in a class you learn that stuff by getting in the trenches and doing and getting in the water over and over and over again and so that's what i advise about a lot of to a lot of entrepreneurs is stop reading the bloody books and stop going to the conferences not that those are bad go to network and meet people and whatever um but roll your sleeves up uh be a practitioner of your craft don't be afraid to fail and uh, learn that way because nobody can take that away from you. Um, and then you can build the skills and the confidence you need to, to keep growing and moving forward. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, speaking of those conferences, uh, that, that's actually where we met. Uh, yeah. was at the, <laughs> yeah. uh, the Trafficking Conversion Summit 2017 right. over in San Diego. Uh, yeah. You gave a fantastic speech, man. Um, Thanks, man. And, and what really stood out was, like you were talking about earlier, uh, how genuine you were on stage, and, and mm. you know that that really uh, that really did inspire me. Um, mm. But but let's talk about some of your um, let's talk about some of your results, right? Because okay. I I want people to know how good you really are uh, at at your craft. So um, you know as as much as you feel comfortable sharing, maybe you could talk a little bit about the success that you have had uh, in in the digital marketing space. Yeah, so success can be defined in many different ways, I find. I mean, some people are fascinated by different numbers. And, you know, one of the people that we consult for spends uh, $3 million a month on Facebook. And people are like, wow, that's great. But I'm like, spending easy, spending money is easy. Um, making it's a little bit harder, but people are like, wow, that's great. So we have some, you know, a pretty high spends. Um, one of the metrics that we measure is return on investment. So how much you spend versus how much you make. Uh, we're currently like on record, as far as I know, as having some of the highest return on investments for Facebook campaigns in the industry uh, with up to 30,000 plus return on investment. So I kind of joke around and I say, hey, man, like even Warren Buffett can't get you returns like that. Um, sometimes success is defined as how long a client stays with you. Um, so we have some of our clients who stayed with us for years and years and years, and I think that's something I'm really proud about. Uh, sometimes success is defined as uh, how well the people you work with are willing to refer you. Um, and so we have, you know, our entire business now is built on the direct referrals of our current clients. And I think that's a great point of success. Uh, so, so at the end of the day, I think success is defined in many different ways. But for the flashy numbers that people like to hear, uh, yeah, we do in fact, I mean, our average ROIs are in the thousands of percent. Um, our highest is again, 30,000 plus. Uh, and we just, we, we get the greatest results uh, on Facebook more than any other person or any other agency that I know of personally. So, so yeah. That is awesome, dude. That <laughs> is outrageous. A 30,000% ROI. I mean, that is crazy. You put in a dollar, and you can get back thirty thousand dollars. That is awesome. So yeah. Now, gonna let me just kind of throw a disclaimer out there. <laughs> First, that doesn't happen every day. Uh, number two, uh, your re these results aren't typical, uh, and you probably won't get the same results. Uh, but with all that being said, yeah, it's nice to have that feather in our cap. That is awesome. So you know, let let's provide some value on this call, and and we have been providing a ton of value, and I want to thank you for all the value that you have provided. But, but let's give people uh, the, the next level, right? Let's talk sure. about how to truly craft the, you know, a, a very optimized Facebook advertisement, right? From, from start to finish, 
yeah. again, as much as you feel, com- feel comfortable sharing, um, how did they go about tr- attempting to get an ROI like that? Yeah. Um, so we could literally spend two hours talking about just that. <laughs> I mean, in fact, I have a whole in-depth training about that. So we won't kind of go into all of that there. Uh, but what I will say is this. There are three keys to crafting a really good Facebook ad. And I use the terminology look, hook, and took. Uh, look means to capture attention. So the first thing that you need to do and think about is when you're creating an ad set or an ad is how do I capture the attention of my ideal prospect? And for me, the easiest way to do that is to have a really good, relevant, eye-catching, storytelling image. Uh, Facebook is a heavily image-driven platform. So the better your image, the better chance or probability that you're going to capture your ideal prospect's attention. So how do we pick a good image? I think one of the key takeaways here is when you're thinking about your image, how can you pick an image that tells a story without words? So they say uh, an image is worth a thousand words. Imagine that the image was all you could use to tell your story or to tell the story of the ad. What image would you choose? Most people like to pick these weird stock images of someone doing absolutely nothing that's completely irrelevant to the whole point. I like to select images that tell a story so that when a person sees that, they're like, wow, okay, I emotionally resonate with that. So that's the look portion. The hook portion is how do you create a connection with the person? So on Facebook, it's a social platform. People go on the platform to connect. And so rather than trying to sell someone something, how do you then build rapport and connect with them? And I think an easy formula to do that is a a, a copy sequence that I call feel, felt, found. And essentially, it sounds a little something like this. It's, hey, I know how you feel. I have felt the same way too until I have found. Now, you're not going to use those words exactly, but the idea is, hey, if I was talking to Facebook advertisers who are looking to use Facebook to build their business even better, I could say something like, hey, man, I've spent so much money, time, energy, and resources trying to crack this Facebook code thing out, and I burned through so much feeling so frustrated and being left nothing but confused. So that's kind of a I know how you feel statement. Um, uh, I know how you feel. Uh, sorry, feel felt found. Sorry. Uh, I have felt the same way too. So the idea is not like you're not alone. I have felt this way too. I can completely relate to you. Uh, until I found this great three-step ad writing formula that I discovered by spending all this money and all this time figuring it out. And now I want to give that to you. So the idea is you build rapport. You do that by relating to the pain of the person, by telling them you were in the same spot and then the solution you found to get out. So that's look and then there's hook, create the connection. And lastly, took, which stands for uh, give an action for someone to take. In other words, every communication you write should have a point and the point should be to take the next step. So maybe it's click here to watch this video. Maybe it's click here to come get this thing that I'm giving you, or maybe it's click here to do whatever. The idea is always assume that the person doesn't know what to do next and you have to instruct them on the next step to take to continue down this path with you. I think if nothing more than people who are writing Facebook ads, just remember the look hook took, uh, their ads will start to get much more engagement and get you much better results than a lot of people are currently getting with their stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, I want to thank you for providing that value. Uh, and, and to everybody that's listening, um, this is a man who is getting extraordinary results. T- listen to the words that he's saying. Truly implement the things into your own business that he's telling you how to do because he's tell- he's giving you the tools that you need to succeed. So, you know, that being said, I feel like a lot of business owners, um, they struggle with, do I want to keep this something that I do? Do I want to be doing my Facebook ads or do yeah. I want to hire it out? Do I want to you know, contract with a, with a boutique firm or, or do I want to you know, get a freelancer? So what yeah. advice could you give to business owners who they may be struggling with that, uh, that, that dilemma of, I kind of want to do it myself, maybe save some money, but I also really need to, this to be done well? Yeah, great, great question. And I, I, if that is the actual argument that some people are making, where I want to do it myself to save some money, uh, I think that's an illegitimate argument. I think you doing it yourself is actually not going to save you money because if you contract with the right person, um, every penny you spend on Facebook actually leads to more dollars. And so it's an investment play. It's not an expense. Advertising is not an expense, and having a good vendor is not an expense. But the, the all, I do get some companies who come to us and say, hey, look, we're spending a lot of money on Facebook right now. 
Um, should we have an in-house team that runs this for us or should we contract out? Which is similar, a similar question, except for the fact that they're not worrying about saving money or losing money. They want to know what's best for them. And the, the answer is really, it's up to you. Um, if you feel like your time is best spent doing the ads yourself, or your team's time is best spent doing the ads yourself, then by all means, do it yourself. Um, if you feel like that team or you are going to be a better asset to your business by focusing on your core genius and what really drives revenue for you, then I would say let go of the things that don't fit into your core genius, only do those things that do fit into your core genius and outsource everything else. So Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach um, calls it your unique ability. It's what makes you you, what are you unique to, what is great for you, only do those things and then outsource or delegate or arrange or have some other people do everything else that falls outside of that category. And I think that's good advice for thinking about Facebook ads, but I also think that's great advice about everything. Do you really want to be your own webmaster? Do you really want to be doing your own sales calls? Do you really want to be doing uh, you know, your accounting just to save a little money? The reality is you're not going to be saving money. Um, that time could be better spent with business revenue generating activity. Um, and it's better oftentimes being outsourced unless again, you love it and you think it's better for you. That's phenomenal advice and, and, uh, advice that I think a lot of entrepreneurs really need to take to heart. Um, that being said, right, I think that there is a point at which outsourcing is appropriate, right? If you're just opening your doors and it's day 14 of your entrepreneurial journey, you probably sure. don't need to go spend a couple thousand dollars on an accountant. Right. So so sure. what would be the appropriate time frame for when an individual says, OK, you know, I need some advertising. I really want to get into the Facebook game. It's time to call Nick. You know, when when is that time? Yeah. Uh, well, call Nick or anybody else who does what, <laughs> what we do. Uh, I think the key point, you should only be spending money on anything for, for that matter in your business when you can actually have a clear path to a return. Um, and the only way to have a clear path to return is to know your metrics and to know for every dollar I spend, I'm going to make X number of dollars because my sales process shows me that this is how that happens. Um, if you don't know those numbers, you probably shouldn't be doing any advertising because you're going to participate in what I call Facebook philanthropy, um, basically donating to the Facebook fund and not getting any return. So we want to avoid that. We want, if you're going to think about spending money on advertising, you should be in a place where you say, I know my sales process works. I know that for every hundred people, let's say, who see my website or come through my sales funnel or whatever, turns into X number of clients and customers, which are valued at X number of dollars, that's the best time to do advertising. Before that, you should probably be figuring out those numbers first before you end up spending anything. Because again, at the end of the day, the goal of business is to write small checks to cash bigger checks. If you're writing small checks and not cashing anything in return, um, that is recipe for disaster. So just think about every expense that you have is truly an investment and should only be spent if it adds to your bottom line. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, I, I do highly uh, want to encourage everybody who kind of may be in that in that right time, that, that right chronological step of thinking about whether they want to bring their marketing in-house or they want to they hire out a boutique, uh, I do highly want to encourage you to reach out to Nick and see if uh, you know the, the, the two of you might be able to form a partnership that, that's beneficial to both. Um, because again, you know Nick is very good at what he does. Um, you know I, I truly don't think anybody can at, at this point in time match his ROI. Uh, so, so I want to highly encourage everybody to reach out to you, Nick. Um, what would be the best way for people to do that? Oh, in, in other words, how do they get in contact with you? Yeah, so a couple of ways. Uh, the first way is you could just go to our website, nicholaskuzmich.com. You can't really contact me through that, but you can at least see what we're up to 
and what we do and see if any of that kind of jives with you and makes sense. Uh, the two best ways really to get involved into my world is number one, um, Facebook, oddly enough. Uh, that's kind of where I play. Um, so if you want to find me on Facebook, I'm the only Nicholas Kuzmich in the entire world, or at least on the Facebook world. So you won't, if you find me, it's me. Um, you know, add me as a friend. I might be at my friend limit, but still follow me and you'll be able to stay in touch with everything that I do. Uh, and secondly, I have a Facebook group called FB Marketing Mastery. It's about 25,000 people in there now, um, and that's my community. That's where I live. That's where I spend some time answering questions for people. It's a great community of some of the some beginner marketers all the way to some of the best Facebook marketers in the planet, all in this group supporting each other and helping people out. Um, it's absolutely free to join. FB Marketing Mastery is a great way for you to stay in, in contact with me. So between my Facebook profile and my Facebook group, those are probably the easiest ways to stay in contact with me. Fantastic, and and to everybody that's that's listening or, or um, you know watching this, however you are getting uh, this content, um, the those links are going to be either in the description below or they're going to be somewhere uh, very readily accessible to you. Again, I highly encourage you to go join that Facebook group. Uh, go go follow Nick on Facebook. You can truly learn a lot. Um, so you know we talked about your past. We talked yeah. about what you're doing right now, uh, and, sure. and and you said you don't really like to to plan out uh too too far ahead but but i do want to talk about your future okay. um where would you like to see yourself moving forward you know what what does the future truly hold for nick yeah uh and the real answer and take it for what it's worth is really no different than what i'm doing now um i think we and when i say we my wife and i and our business are at the place where we're we're happy um, can it always be tweaked? Sure. And can some new things come about? Sure. And am I open to new opportunity? Absolutely. I'm not thinking about new opportunity, but if, if one comes across my way, fantastic. So um, I think the future is just a, a whole lot more of how things are now um, with an older daughter, uh, you know, which leads to a whole new more adventures. Uh, but that's really it. Like I, I've, for whatever it's worth, I, I'm not, uh, I'm, my life is not dictated on future outcomes anymore. Um, I'm not looking for one day if I achieve that, I'll be great. Uh, I'm in a great place. And I've, I've achieved the pinnacle of where I need to be. I um, mean, I will continue to stay up here and maybe I'll slip and fall sometimes and then I'll just get back up and keep going. Um, but really and truly, uh, there is there is nothing else I'd rather be doing or anywhere else I'd rather be than currently doing what I'm doing now. So. So, yeah, it's a good place. Wow, that's powerful. So, you know, when you're not out there tearing it up on Facebook and, and you know, providing tons of value uh, to, to everybody, what do you like doing? You know, what, when, you're not, when you're not doing business, what, what do you like to spend your time doing? Uh, yeah, you know, great question. I, uh, my wife and I like to go on dates. Now we like to bring our daughter. Uh, just two nights ago, uh, my daughter won hockey tickets, so we went to the hockey game with her and watched that, and we – eight and we take her to swimming lessons and we do all this kind of fun stuff so really at the end of the day it's not about what we do and this is another thing i've learned it's not so much about what you do but who you do it with um that really makes it fun uh so we could be driving around the neighborhood in circles uh but if it's with my wife and i and some of our great friends and we're having some great conversation in the car then so be it um so yeah it's it's Fun to me is defined by who we have our experiences with, not what the actual experiences are, uh, although certain experiences are fun. Um, but yeah, that's a, we just like spending time with some really good people and, and living life together that way. That's awesome. That's fantastic. So, you know, I, I really do want to thank you for all the time that you have spent, uh, you know, on this interview so far. I just have a couple more questions for you. Really enjoy all right. our time together. Um, yeah. You know, having having done all the things that you've done, and, and you know, you've had your highs and lows, and and you know, you've worn a ton of different hats. Who do you really see yourself as, right? If you were if you were to describe yourself to somebody else, who would you describe yourself as? Uh, in this order, uh, loving husband, uh, trying to be an amazing father and aspiring entrepreneur. Um, I mean, I think we have a great business, but I don't think we've necessarily made it. And I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I'm a great entrepreneur just because I have multi seven, multi, seven multiple multi-million dollar businesses. Um, 
I'm aspiring to be a better business person, but that, that only comes like thirdly to being a great husband and uh, and a great father. Wow, that's powerful. That really is. So, mm-hmm. you know, I do have one more question for you. All right. Um, is there anything about yourself that you think is an important part of who you are that I did not ask you about today? In other words, what did I miss? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you 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 took me places that I don't usually go to on podcasts. <laughs> so good job on that, and kudos to you. Uh, I think the biggest thing is, and and I don't think this is right for everybody, but at least for me, um, my greatest path to advancement and success and happiness and however you want to term that idea. Um, has come from uh, me intentionally or unintentionally trying to be as unconventional as possible. So if everybody was going left, I was going right. When everyone was zigging, I was zagging. Um, I think most of these fluffy memes and good advice and motivational quotes are nothing more than anecdotal BS. Um, you know, you're the you're the sum total of the five people you hang around with the most. I don't think that's true. Um, you know, you're you're only as good as your goals are only as good as you write them down. Uh, no, not in my life. Um, you know, and so on and so on. We hear these kind of anecdotal kind of motivational things, and many people are leading their lives by them. And again, I think for some people that's great and fine and dandy. Uh, but I would encourage at least the person who that stuff has let them down. So when the motivational memes has let you down, when going and reading the books has let you down, and when all these things that promise lofty things didn't actually bring to fruition the things that you were hoping for, for that person, I'm talking to you right now, um, maybe the way of the common person is not your way. And maybe you should be open to considering things outside common sense. Um, For me, and I think this came out a little bit, but uh, but you know, if I didn't emphasize it enough, it's common knowledge doesn't necessarily have to mean it's common for you. Common sense doesn't have to mean that it's just common for you. And maybe the road less traveled, although that's anecdotal in and of itself, so I don't like to use that, but maybe the counter to what many people are saying to be true um, is the path for you to find what it is that you're looking for. So we'll leave it at that. That's awesome. That is great. That you know, great ending to a great interview. Um, so you know, again, I highly encourage everybody to check out the links either in, in the description below or, or somewhere accessible to you. Uh, they they should be close by. Uh, Nick, I want to I want to thank you so much for your time, man. Uh, it is of course. an absolute pleasure. Um, you know, and and to everybody listening, I want to thank you because y'all are the reason that we do this. Um, you know, you, you guys come and, and, and listen time after time, and you know, I do want to thank you so much for all the support and all the love. Uh, it truly means a lot, and, and it, you know, it keeps me going. So, thank you very much. Um, this has been another Project Egg interview. Today, we've been talking to Nick Kuzmich from Toronto. Have a good one. All right.